So the current economic shock has taught us anything. It is that despite all the new controls, rules, regulations put in by Congress after the financial crisis, Wall Street has, shall we say, a way of finding new and inventive ways of creating things to sell. Wall Street continues to create special purpose vehicles to enrich themselves and put the entire economy at risk. The Collateralized Loan Obligation, or CLO, is no different. Basically, they take below investment grade corporate bonds. Yes, you heard that right, below investment grade. They package them up, take a fee, and sell them to investors looking for higher returns. Sound familiar? It definitely should. It's the financial crisis all over again. And if you missed the big short, this clip does a much better job explaining everything than I can. So let's watch Margot Robbie in a bubble bath. Just substitute mortgage-backed securities for CLOs. Mortgage-backed securities, <laughs> subprime loans, tranches. It's pretty confusing, right? Does it make you feel bored or stupid? Well, it's supposed to. Wall Street loves to use confusing terms to make you think only they can do what they do. Or even better, for you just to leave them the fuck alone. So here's Margot Robbie in a bubble bath to explain. Basically, Louis Rainieri's mortgage bonds were amazingly profitable for the big banks. They made billions and billions on their 2% fee they got for selling each of these bonds. But then they started running out of mortgages to put in them. After all, there are only so many homes and so many people with good enough jobs to buy them, right? So the banks started filling these bonds with riskier and riskier mortgages. Thank you, Andrew. That way, they can keep that profit machine churning, right? By the way, these risky mortgages are called subprime. So whenever you hear subprime, think shit. Our friend Michael Burry found out that these mortgage bonds that were supposedly 65% AAA were actually just mostly full of shit. So now he's going to short the bonds, which means to bet against. Got it? Now fuck off. Basically, the amount of shit packed into CLOs has ballooned in the past 12 years. And will the number of pending defaults bring down the entire financial market? Make sure to smash that like button. Let's find out more. Like the hundreds of billions of dollars in subprime mortgage-backed securities that basically broke bank balance sheets more than 10 years ago, a similar, but simpler, Wall Street product needs to be on your radar if it's not already. You've probably heard about them. They're called CLOs, Collateralized Loan Obligations. No, not CDOs. Those are collateralized debt obligations, which of course just, you know, helped destroy the banking system in 2008. CLOs are bundles of business loans generally made to smaller or mid-sized companies, some of whom have maybe troubled balance sheets or have maxed out their own borrowing, can't sell bonds directly to investors, or do not qualify for traditional bank loans. There are some key differences than CDOs, the biggest of which, and they're important, is that there are no mortgages in them and there are none of the dangerous credit default swaps, remember those, built into those products. Now the market for these CLOs, they have boomed in the past decade. The loan market is now valued at more than $750 billion at the end of 2018, with some estimates pegging the number of CLO markets, because there are leverage used, at 1.2 trillion most priced in US dollars. But while this market may have survived relatively unscathed pre-pandemic, the current crisis has exposed its weak points and according to our next guest, could lead to a crisis bigger and more serious than what we saw in 2008. How's that for an introduction? Joining us now is UC Berkeley School of Law professor, Frank Partnoy, who detailed this new major risk in the current issue of the Atlantic, the looming bank collapse. It has been one of their most read stories for about a week and it should be, and by the way, one of the top five business books I've ever read it was written by that gentleman called The Match King. Frank, it's a pleasure to get you back on nice and early from California. Thank you. It's an important topic. How Thanks less so much. It's risky, great to see you. Or more risky uh, are CLOs, how much more or more less risky are CLOs than CDOs? Well, it really depends on the time. So back in 2007, 2008, CLOs weren't risky at all. We weren't worried about these businesses all defaulting simultaneously. We were worried about subprime mortgages defaulting simultaneously. Right now in the pandemic, we have a lot of businesses that are troubled that are very likely to default. And so today CLOs are the more dangerous. 
How much, and your article noted, as of annual filings or quarterly filings, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, and Citibank had, if my numbers are right, about 70 to 80 billion on their balance sheets. AIG had a few billion more. How much do you think is out there ultimately across the bank balance sheet spectrum? I think your numbers are about right in aggregate, and we know that there's certainly more than 100 billion of CLOs at banks. And the Fed has done a study that essentially said that. We also know that there are about 100 billion or so of CLOs that are unaccounted for, where we can't find them. And we're getting lots of surprises on CLOs. So JP Morgan announced that it had lost $2 billion, an unrealized loss on CLOs. Basically, nobody even noticed that that had happened. And Wells Fargo recently announced that it had $7.7 billion of what are called loan form CLOs that were a surprise to many people. So these are big numbers. We're talking about for those three banks. We're talking about significant numbers. And it's not they're not the kind of numbers that will bring the bank down on their own. But they are uh, numbers that should cause us concern when coupled with other kinds of losses that banks inevitably are going to have in the next quarter and beyond this year. You lose your phone, you hit a button, it starts beeping. I don't know how $100 billion in a Wall Street product just goes missing. Maybe we need to find my CLO thing. Either way, Frank, let's move on. Okay, here is the problem with 2007. We're going to get a history lesson. As we know, everything was sort of stacked together. Triple A, single A, double B, B, C, like a Jenga game, of course, famous from the movie The Big Short. And the bottom went bad, and so the whole thing collapsed. Our CLOs, the ones at least that you have seen, are they structured the same way as the risk still in that sort of, you know, small percentage at the bottom, but kind of holding everything up? Yes, the basic idea is the same. So you have underlying credits, the loans themselves that are rated single B or triple C. 15% of them are triple C, about two thirds are single B. So those underlying loans are risky loans. But the idea is that when you package them, that the top part of the CLO should be low risk in the same way the top part of the CDO was thought to be low risk in 2007. Now, the problem is if a lot of these loans all default at the same time, the way subprime mortgages all defaulted at the same time, then even those top layers, the layers that are rated AAA or AA, can become at risk. So in late March, we know that the AAA layers were seriously at risk, and there were major concerns about the pricing of those AAA layers. The Fed has intervened, and so we yeah. had support psychologically in the market. But many people are worried that the losses that are increasing in the future will start to eat into those AAA and AA layers. And that's a critically important distinction because we're not here to terrify people at 5.50 in the morning, 2.50 your time, Frank. The problem with 2007 is eight, as we now know, looking in hindsight, was that nobody, not many people anyway, <clears throat> saw it coming. And they didn't act in time to save those mortgages that went bad, thus crashing everything down. All these Fed programs are really hard to keep track of, even for people who track them for a living. Do you think the Fed has gotten out enough ahead of this because of what we learned 12 years ago? Certainly the Fed has been very quick, and they've learned that it's important to really impact the psychology of markets. So that's what they did in response to late March. And that's what they're doing now. That's what they did yesterday with a new program that was announced for secondary lending. Also, it's interesting to note the Fed said after all the bad news last week that it's going to start examining banks more. It had said it wouldn't be doing that. So the Fed obviously is concerned and they're getting ahead. They're being quick. Um, and it's a lot of money. But one of the other important things to recognize is that the Fed isn't buying everything. The Fed can't buy every piece of debt that's out there. And Dodd-Frank, the legislation after the last financial crisis, restricted the Fed. So the Fed isn't able to buy investments in insolvent institutions. It's not supposed to prop up banks. So it has restrictions, and it's not supposed to rely on credit ratings. But if you look at the term sheets that the Fed is putting out now very, very frequently, including yesterday, they are relying on credit ratings. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about these Fed programs. We'll hear from the chair uh, today and tomorrow, and he very well may be addressing some of this uncertainty about these yeah. programs. You, you think the credit rating agencies are going to get it right this time? We screwed it up last time. Big time. Right. And you, you were very prescient in that and criticizing the credit rating agencies. And unfortunately, some of the same kinds of models Thank that you. were used then are being used now today. So the same kinds of concerns today with respect to what supposedly is a AAA rating. It sounds like the banks may need additional capital to cover CLO losses. 
maybe the Fed should find out which banks are at the highest risk. What is your take on what has come out and can you connect the dots to the after hours actions that we're seeing specifically, for instance, Goldman Sachs is down two and a half percent, Citibank, Citicorp, excuse me, Citigroup. Let me get that straight. Citigroup is up by one and a quarter percent. JP Morgan's basically flat. Sure. I think what we saw today was some definitive numbers on the stress capital buffers. Now, as you know, the stress capital buffers is factored into the capital ratios for these banks. And all of the banks, with the exception of Goldman, which is why Goldman's trading down, their, their capital ratios that they submitted at the beginning of this testing period, which are fourth quarter of 2019, those capital ratios exceeded the required capital ratios, with the exception, again, of Goldman. Now, granted, Goldman missed it by one-tenth of one percent. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, they could manage their assets to um, lower that ratio to get it in line. But what's important here is that the banks, once again, and one of the fellows mentioned it already, they've been going through the stress test now for over 10 years. The banks are very strong. they got strong balance sheets and plenty of liquidity. The uncertainty, though, comes in with these new scenarios with the COVID-19, the sensitivity analysis. The banks are going to have to resubmit the stress test under much tougher conditions, and that's where some vulnerability could come on the dividends later this year. Corporations continue missing loan payments, and take a look at the CLO delinquency rates and the hockey stick charts for retail and lodging. When do you think that the CLO problems are going to hit the entire financial sector? Leave a comment below and make sure to subscribe for additional content on what's really happening in the financial and real estate markets.